Okay, so we're going to move forward into the cutaneous senses, and I'm going to start out with touch, and then we'll talk about pain. So we're going to be talking about the cutaneous senses and um, basically talking about touch and pain, even though there is more to the cutaneous senses than, than that. But this is couched under or is part of the somatosensory system. So I've done this before of soma being body and the sensory, the feeling of the body. Uh, the cutaneous senses are responsible for uh, everything we perceive of uh, the stimulation of the skin. So, for example, touch and pain, but this also includes things like itch, tickle, um, hot and cold, um, uh, vibrations. This, the cutaneous senses uh, help us with our grasping. They um, protect us. The skin protects us against damage, uh, and the cutaneous senses, touch and pain, protect us against damage. They also... Um, the feeling of touch motivates sexual activity. Your author talks here a bit about how most people, many people, if you are asked to give up one of your senses, people feel really strongly that they would not want to give up vision. We are very visual animals and they would not want to give up hearing. And some people pick touch and he says this would be, this would be a large mistake for a lot of reasons as we're actually going to see as we move forward. But sexual activity is, is important and that motivation. Um, we also have under the somatosensory system proprioception, so, so this feeling of the position of the body and the limbs, where our body is in space, and the kinesthesis, uh, our kinesthetic feelings of uh, the movement of the body and limbs. And these work together very closely. And I also have under both of these the vestibular influences on proprioception and kinesthesis, but then also as we're moving through the world, this affects our vestibular system as well. So it's all very tightly linked. She's done some additional research just examining um, how much we touch each other in different cultures. And, and uh, we noticed that in, so they watched people in a cafe or something like that for 30 minutes uh, in the United States and in France. And they watched people for how many times were people doing this just kind of friendly touch. So uh, a hug, uh, those kisses on the cheek that the Europeans often do, just touching someone on the shoulder. So these just friendly touch. OK, and at, for 30 minutes, the United, the cafe in the United States, there were two instances of touch in France. There were 200 instances of touch. One of the things Tiffany Field suggests is that um, we, the, one of the reasons that we see the kind of violence and everything we see in America is partly that we're simply not willing to touch each other as much. That's a pretty far reach and there's a lot of confounds, but uh, I, I find the cafe study very interesting. Someone else who has looked at the um, the effect of touch or the importance of touch is Mary Carlson, and she's looked more at the negative effect, negative effects of not being touched. So she went into those overcrowded orphanages in Romania. If you've heard about those, um, what was happening basically there was that they the orphanages are so crowded and there are so few uh, nannies or women taking care of these babies and children that when they're babies, they basically just walk through and prop up a bottle for this one, prop up a bottle for this one, and walk through and prop up the bottles, and then go back and take it, take away the bottles. So those kids are not really being touched. And if we look at um, the effects of, of that, of, of being brought up in those orphanages, uh, they, if you'll just, so now it looks like a lot of people from Great Britain and Canada went in once, once they heard about this and adopted uh, a lot of those children, although it sounds like there's still some problems um, over there of, of overcrowded orphanages uh, to this day. But uh, but every time people kind of hear about this, there's this, this rush to really adopt and help those children. And the younger those children were adopted, the better off they were. But the longer they were in those orphanages, the uh, more likely they were to have smaller stature, um, uh, smaller brains, and to be um, cognitively and socially um, have less sort of IQ. They just had less few, less ability, both cognitively and, and socially. 
So that was taken as some negative effects of, of not being touched. I'm going to say it, there are some confounds there as well. That's what we call a natural experiment, as um, they're also not receiving a lot of language and they're not um, probably receiving the healthiest of food. But so I'm going to go back to the Tiffany Field. That premature baby study, those babies were randomly assigned. That's why experiments are, are important. So the skin, the monumental facade of the human body, as uh, discussed by Kumel, 1953. This is our heaviest organ. This is our largest sensory system. It is all over our body. It prevents body fluids from escaping. It protects us from bacteria, chemical agents, um, dirt, things that could really uh, hurt us if it got, they got inside our body. And it provides us with information about various stimuli. And we're going to talk about a lot of the information, what we what what we can learn about the world from our sense of touch and um, from uh, perceiving stimulation of the skin. As I think most of us know, we have the epidermis, which are the outer layers of skin, which is dead skin cells, I think, and the dermis, the, the layer below the epidermis. I think most of us know this because I think, at least I remember back in um, seventh or eighth grade, the science teacher having us do that uh, putting tape on ourselves and uh, taking it off, and you have these dead skin cells uh, on the tape. We're going to look at some of the mechanoreceptors, which are um, our sensory receptors for the sense of touch. Uh, these receptors, some of them are more in the epidermis, and some of them lie below the epidermis in the in the lower layer in the in the dermis, uh, and they are going to respond to mechanical stimulation, uh, pressure, stretching, and vibration. And I'm going to walk us through the mechanoreceptors. Okay, I feel like there's a lot to the mechanoreceptors, and I usually do this demonstration in class, and it's I'm going to have to do it with the slides. So we're going to start by talking about the Merkel receptors and the Meissner corpuscles, sometimes called Merkel discs, but the Meissner corpuscles are always called Meissner corpuscles as far as I've ever seen. These are the nerve endings here are up in the epidermis. Okay, if we look at the Merkel receptors, they are what's called slowly adapting. So we saw uh, the effects of, or we, we know that there's adaptation of our, our visual system, of our hearing system, right, of all of those neurons are going to adapt, but they do so slowly. They're going to be stimulated for a long time before they have adapted. And that's how the Merkel receptors work. Uh, so they're going to fire continuously. As long as someone's touching my arm, my Merkel receptors are underneath that touch are going to be firing. They will adapt slowly. So they're going to tell us about um, uh, things we are, are feeling. They're going to tell us about pressure or someone um, putting pressure or putting, uh, touching our arm or our hand or whatever. And we're going to use, we can use our hands to then, and those Merkel receptors are going to tell us about the fine details. I'm going to have to walk through uh, a few of these and then, and then go through my example with the next slide. But so the Meissner corpuscles, they are what are called quickly adapting. And they tell us about our hand grip control is, is one real example of what they do. But so um, if I am grabbing something hard like um, my table and I want to pick it up, I'm going to have a different hand grip control. If I'm grabbing something like uh, my dog, for my cat, I'm going to have a different kind of hand grip control. And the Meissner corpuscle, when I say it's quickly adapting, what it's doing is it's going to fire when that when that touch or when that when that uh, hand grip starts, and then it's going to stop firing as I don't need to keep feeling that because I know my hand grip. But unless it changes, and it's going because it's going to fire when it starts, and it's going to fire when it stops. So it has this firing when it's on. And then fire, firing when it goes when it goes off, and that's kind of the way the corpuscles work. So the Merkel receptors and the Meissner corpuscles, because they're up in that epidermis, they have smaller receptive fields. Again, again, I know everybody wanted to talk about receptive fields again of what is actually influencing the firing of of a neuron. Uh, when we are looking at the Ruffini cylinders and the Pacinian corpuscles, they have larger receptive fields as they are down farther in the down in the dermis. Okay, and the Ruffini cylinder, sometimes called Ruffini endings, 
uh, they have uh, they are also slowly adapting so they're going to fire to continuous pressure and what they respond to is really the stretching of the skin and usually when we think of stretching we are really thinking of stretching our muscles right but there's times when the skin stretches as well and again i'm going to give this example with with my keys in just a second after i talk about the pacinian corpuscles so the pacinian corpuscle uh, notice that corpuscle is on there again which is going to tell me really that this is rapidly adapting okay it's going to fire when something comes on it's going to fire when that when that comes off okay and it responds to vibration and we often give the i often give the example of or a lot of people do of feeling your refrigerator or um, feeling your car running that kind of vibration pacinian corpuscles however also give us information about uh, the texture of objects and so we can feel the details of objects based on our um, Merkel receptors, but we, we can also, and we're going to see the, some studies looking at this, we can also move our, our fingers across an object, right, or move our hand across an object and feel this vibration, this change, which is going to tell us about the details of an object as well. Okay, I'm going to use my example of my keys to talk about, to talk about all of this again. So when I am holding my car key, it has a, it's what has one of those plastic tops it has a really different feel than when i'm holding my office key okay so i'm going to go back and forth and try to go back and forth in your head between something like one of your car keys and then something more like your house key or, or, or an office key uh, so those merkel receptors are telling me about the feeling of the plastic versus the feeling of the of the metal and, and where the holes are and and all of that the Meissner corpuscles are telling me about my hand grip. I'm going to have a different kind of grip on the car key than I'm going to have to hold on the, and I usually hold my office key a little bit tighter, right? So it doesn't slip through my fingers and the, off, and the car key is, is kind of soft. So it has a, a not as hard of a grip and the grip is different. And because the grip is different, my hand is in a different um, configuration as I'm holding those two keys. So if I go, if I'm going back and forth between my car key and my office key, then I'm also gonna have different Ruffini cylinders that are telling me about the stretching of the skin, about exactly how my skin is stretched around those keys. And, then, and so that's my best example, except if you think about maybe um, uh, moving your finger a bit, that that skin is gonna stretch, okay? We also, so the other thing I often use as an example, so I can get the Pisidian corpuscle in there and how all of these mechanoreceptors tell us about our world. So if I take the office key and I put it in my office door and I feel that burp, burp, as we're going in and out, that's the Pisidian corpuscle, right? It's telling me about that little bit of vibration and the, the, that feeling. Okay, so there is one example and you can try and think of another and apply this so that you're really thinking about how am I using these different sensory receptors to feel my world. But there's one example of how all of the mechanoreceptors are telling us about something as simple as what key am I holding and how am I gonna use it? And what does it feel like to use it? Uh, all of these peripheral nerves, so bundles of nerve fibers from the skin uh, are gonna enter the spinal cord from the dorsal root. So if you know your kind of ventral and dorsal, which I haven't done a lot in this class of the ventral and dorsal, but in the brain, Dorsal is up at the top of the head and ventral is down towards the bottom of the head and then towards the bottom of the brain. As we get into our, our body, then the dorsal is towards the back and the ventral is towards the front. And you can kind of remember that or think about that as the dorsal fin of a shark is what we see along the, along the back. Uh, so the dorsal root, um, we're getting sensory information in through that dorsal root. And you can see here in this picture as I'm about to go talk about the medial lemniscal pathway, what's called on this picture, the medial lemniscus, same thing, medial lemniscal pathway, it is going to uh, travel uh, up the spinal cord ipsilaterally on the same side uh, as that the nerve bundle, that the side that the nerve bundle co comes in from, and it's going to cross, we're gonna have that same kind of contralaterality that's gonna cross over in the um, brainstem and then go over contralaterally to the other side for of the thalamus to synapse in the thalamus 
So I'm going to talk about the two major pathways of the spinal cord. I like to do, start that with the picture because the picture is helpful. But the medial lumniscal pathway, these are our large fibers. This is a this pathway is communicating more quickly. It's a faster communication. This, these are myelinated large fibers. Uh, this is how we get our sense, our perception of touch, as well as that proprioception to tell us where our limbs are in space. And again, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the medial lumniscal pathway here as we're talking about touch, and then the spinothalamic pathway where uh, temperature, pain, and itch all go up the spinothalamic pathway. Uh, that one is um, has smaller fibers. Uh, some of those fibers, especially for the kind of dull pain, a lot of those fibers are moving a lot more slowly because they're unmyelinated. Some of them are moving, they're all moving more slowly than the larger fibers. It's just that's what happens with the, um, with the, with the size of the axons. But um, some of these are actually unmyelinated, and so they're moving much more slowly. Okay, and so again, I have temperature and pain as part of the spinothalamic pathway. I'll put itch in there as well. We see a separation of function between these two pathways and one of the people. So there are many different people who can tell that t show us this, but one of them is Ian Waterman, and he's discussed here as he had. Um, let's see if I can remember the the story, the um, everything about what I know about Ian Waterman, because I usually get some questions. Uh, he was 17 years old, working in a butcher shop. And he had a fever, got sick, and uh, when he started feeling better, uh, what he realized, what happened was um, he, his autoimmune system started attacking the, the fibers in this medial lumniscal pathway. So he lost his ability to feel touch and the ability, that, that sense of proprioception, so the sense of positions of his, of his limbs. What he ended up doing because he could not really feel uh, any touch or where his limbs were, was to constantly visually check to see where his limbs were so that he could um, send a motor command to figure out, to then then move his limb and then watch where, watch where it goes. And then, so he had to relearn basically movement and not based on the information that we usually use for making our movements. And when he had no, visual information it just felt like this kind of floating sensation so there is a description of him lying in bed at night and just feeling kind of like he's floating uh, there's also the description of um, him being in an elevator where uh, the elevator breaks and the lights go off and when the lights come back on he's just crumpled to the floor because he this he he needs the visual information to know where his body is and to feel how his body is moving. And so it's really, uh, he was really distraught in, in that situation. Uh, obviously he didn't work for a butcher anymore and uh, this changed his life a great deal. However, in many ways, we're gonna say he was lucky because he still had the spinothalamic pathway doing its job. So he was still able to sense pain and temperature. People who cannot feel pain they have, um, they usually have a much shorter lifespan as they'll have something like a burst appendix and not feel it, or they can have frostbite and not feel it. And so um, they can have, a, pain is telling us about damage that's being done and, and things that we need to avoid. Uh, so they have a much more sort of dangerous life than, than Ian Waterman. So we have these two major pathways up the spinal cord. Uh, information from both pathways is going to cross over to the other side. If you go back to that picture that was that was here earlier, the spinothalamic pathway, it's, it crosses over contralaterally um, in the spinal cord at that at that dermatome, at that place where the where the nerves come in. Uh, so when we get to the thalamus, they're both contralateral. Okay, most fibers synapse in the ventral posterior nucleus of the thalamus. So there's our thalamic nucleus for um, this sensory system and some synapse and other thalamic nuclei. The thalamus is going to do its job of summarizing, filtering, uh, organizing information and sending that on for higher level processing right in the, in the cortex. 
the, and then that's going to get sent from the thalamus to the somatosensory receiving area. And I know I've alluded or talked about the um, somatosensory area a couple of times just at the very beginning of class. Again, feeling the body. This is my primary receiving area for touch and pain and itch and tickle and all of that. And it is in that in the parietal cortex in the very anterior in the very front part of the parietal cortex is the uh, primary receiving area. We're also getting information to the secondary receipt secondary somatosensory cortex or S2 from the thalamus and we're going to see signals from um, S1 to S2 uh, and then back from S2 to S1 and to some additional somatosensory areas. I'm going to provide the mapping here so the organization as we have talked about the different um, areas receiving areas so far and that they each have had their own mapping or organization, which remember is different than receptive field and what's causing the neuron to fire, but that these neurons that are firing uh, to a particular area of our body are in a particular place. And in this case, this is often referred to as um, a somatotopic map or sometimes referred to as this is the what they call the homunculus, which means little man. Uh, and if we look at the homunculus, and the body mapping. So as we get up towards the um, the dorsal sort of medial area, right where the two hemispheres come together, uh, as we go down into that a little bit, um, a little bit ventrally, we're going to feel our foot. And then as we continue to go down into that you know, that um, fissure there, we're going to get into our, feeling our genitals. We can see our foot, is, our feet are next to our genitals there. Again, this is contralateral. If I am feeling something. And then I'm going to move uh, dorsally and then uh, laterally out uh, out a bit down the somatosensory cortex. If I move down, I'm going to get to my um, body, which has very little space there, the head. And I'm going to, you see now my, if we look at the hand, the hand is very large, right? And I have um, a lot of brain space for the feeling of the hand. And if I'm, feel, so I'm feeling something with my left hand, okay, I'm going to feel that. And I'm going to point, and you want, might want to point to your own brain here. I'm going to feel that on in my right primary somatosensory cortex, uh, just a little bit down as I'm, I'm moving towards my towards my ear as I'm as I feel my my hand. And I have more cortical space, so I'm going to talk about this cortical magnification. If you remember, we saw cortical magnification for the fovea in vision. It's going to give us more um, detail, more acuity. Right, and so we can see I have a lot of acuity for my hand, and um, this little head up head that's up towards my body. I have very little space for my entire the entire trunk of my body. That little mini head it doesn't really exist there. What we what we have it's just showing the person, but what we have as we're moving from if you notice my hand is actually close to the, feeling the top of my head in the mapping in the somatosensory cortex, and you can see. Uh, not only is my hand pretty large, but look at the lips, right? We have our lips are very uh, sensitive, and as we move down, we have we have a pretty good amount of um, space dedicated to our tongue, our tongue as well.